In this video, we are going to talk about policies for your classroom management to make things go more smoothly. Specifically, we're going to chat about late work, retake policies, and the dreaded cell phone policy and how you're gonna handle those. These can be tricky, so let's talk about setting boundaries and expectations right from the start. Hey, it's Ashley, aka Senior to Spanish, where I provide easy to use resources to save you time and energy, reduce your stress level and your workload while you are planning for your Spanish classes. If you're new here, make sure to click that subscribe button, and then I just want to make sure you know that links to everything that I mentioned in this video will be down in the description box below. We're going to talk about why you should consider these policies even before the school year begins, what these policies might look like, and how you can communicate them to students, to guardians, and to the admin at your school. So if you've seen my video on your syllabus for your Spanish class, you know that I think it's important that you come up with your policies beforehand. You're not creating these policies on the fly as you find out, oh shoot, I really needed to have something in mind for this situation. You wanna think ahead because you don't want to be making decisions in the moment. It really helps to clear up any confusion and that way they know that you're not picking on their student. You just do things this way and you communicated that to everyone right away at the beginning of the year. Sometimes your school has a policy already, but not always. And there are a few things that I think belong on your syllabus, that if your school doesn't already have a plan in place, you need to make sure you have communicated your expectations. So let's talk about late work, retake policies, and cell phones. Oh, and as a quick reminder, my experience has been in eighth through 12th graders, Spanish one and Spanish two in elective classes, just because I know sometimes our settings are a little bit different and that might change expectations for your classroom versus mine. So let's chat about a late work policy first. For me, as long as you get it to me before a final deadline towards the end of the semester, it's fine. I'll take it without penalty. I don't do the whole 10% off per day thing. I don't do the X amount of points off per day thing. Just get me your stuff. For one, that's just more headache for me to have to keep track how many days it's been since I assigned the thing. Second, taking points off doesn't really show me their understanding or if it was a formative, it doesn't really kind of help me check in on where they were. It just shows me that they were disorganized, forgetful, had other priorities, had something else going on, right? It's not actually measuring their grade. It's just showing me that they had something else going on in their lives and they are human. I do put in a cutoff date towards the end of the semester and here's how that works. The schools will give me the deadline and say grades have to be submitted by date. I look at that deadline and I count back one to two weeks, usually two, like giving myself some cushion, and I say, okay students, here is the deadline for when I will take your late work. There is an exception to my late work rule and that is in my retake policy, so let's chat about that. When it comes to formative assessments like exit and entrance tickets, I generally build in two to three tries anyways. Students retake them as a bit of a check-in just throughout the unit naturally, so that's not such a big deal. Plus they're smaller anyways, that's just part of being informative. I do have a video where I discuss entrance and exit tickets, and if you want to check that out here, you can see a couple examples of different kinds of exit tickets I like to do in my class. I'll put that right here for you. For summative assessments like chapter tests or projects, I do allow retakes, but there's a little bit of a procedure to it. At first, I was never really against retakes, but I really struggled with how to organize them them and how to make them useful and not just like feel like a waste of time both for me and for them right because if they just retake it without actually relearning anything it kind of feels like you're throwing spaghetti at the wall and you're wasting everybody's time. So in the last few years in the classroom, I kind of wiggled my way into a system and it looks like this. Students complete an assessment and receive feedback. In order to do a retake on any part of a learning target, students must create and complete a learning plan. If they want to do multiple learning targets from one chapter assessment, that would be multiple plans. And the reason for this is because maybe they'll do really, really well on one portion of the test and not super well on the other. They don't need to retake the whole test Test, right we're just looking at this one skill or this one area so that way their learning plan is all going to focus on this they submit the plan to me via Gmail and I either make suggestions or I approve the plan this step of the plan seems a lot like busy work to them but I have found 
that not all students really know or understand which practices are the best for them to work on those things, right? Let's look at what's actually going to help you and I'll help them find pieces of their workbook or maybe homework or whatever. This is a vital step to make sure the practices are actually useful. If they want to do multiple learning targets from one chapter assessment, that would be multiple plans. And the reason for this is because maybe they'll do really, really well on one portion of the test and not super well on the other. They don't need to retake the whole test, right? We're just looking at this one skill or this one area. So that way their learning plan is all going to focus on this. Some students might wind up with two or three sections of a test. And if that's the case, then they're going to do learning plans for each of those separate sections. The other part of this step of the retake process is that they must have all missing work completed because most of our in-class work is preparation for the assessment. So if they didn't do some of that in-class work, chances are it's going to help them with whatever part of the assessment they needed more work on anyways. So that's built into this part of the retake plan as well. Okay, step four of the retake process is for them to complete their plan. So once they've submitted their plan and I've approved it, they're gonna actually do the plan. And then they're gonna submit me proof. If it's screenshots of something online, if they have workbook pages, whatever it is, they're going to bring it to me and I'm going to give them feedback. And at this point in time, they're either gonna get the okay to schedule a retake or we're gonna say, oh, no, 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 we don't have this. Finally, we schedule and then do the actual retake. Then I grade it and the second score replaces their first score no matter what. A few notes here, the actual retake is different than the first test. Students don't get a second shot at something they've already done. This can be a little tricky for you because you basically have to make two versions of a test, but this is where I really lean on my department and we worked together to create multiple formats. Okay, last but not least, the dreaded cell phone policy. <laughs> if your school doesn't have a cell phone policy, you need to have one. Or if there is a cell phone policy, but it's lackluster at best, maybe you want to put your own policy in place for your classroom. Cell phones aren't to be out in the classroom unless we're using them for a learning activity and I said yes. If one student is on it, like staring at it, but they're not bothering their classmates, I will remind them one time and then I move on. There are at least 25 other kids, like at least, who need me. I can't spend all my time trying to get you to put your phone away. If it is a consistent problem over a week, I email them and I CC their guardians. If it continues, I email again, again CCing guardians and pointing to how it's affecting their grade because it always is affecting their grade if it's a consistent problem over a longer period of time. I offer to help them come up with a plan for their success in avoiding phone use in their classrooms, such as dropping it off at my whiteboard ledge when they come in, putting it on their desks, zipping it up, locking it in their locker, right? There's lots of different options, but I just offer, hey, I'm willing to support you in this. What's something that we can do to make this work? Then we monitor and we continue the conversation as necessary. If they are on their phones and they are bothering classmates, or they're detracting, like maybe they're supposed to be doing a partner activity and they're staring at their phone instead of doing the partner activity. That's a different situation in my opinion. I have them put it on the ledge or on my desk for the remainder of the class period. If that's an issue for them, I offer them the choice to walk down to the office and turn it in there. Sometimes I communicate with guardians and we really get somewhere. We come up with a plan, the guardians are backing me up, and things happen, things change. Sometimes I email and it's like, did I just send my email off into the void? I never hear anything from them. So if that's the case, then I email counselors next, check to see if it's a problem in other classes. I might even reach out to a coach or a director or somebody else at the school who is part of an activity that the student is part of for additional support, right? If it's really bad and it's affecting their grades, it's going to affect their eligibility and that person is probably going to care about that student's choices and that would be another person who would help me deal with this. So I think that these are all things that you need to decide and have in place along with a few other policies and procedures that you need to communicate at the beginning of the school year and those are all things that I think go on your syllabus. Whether or not your school requires you to have a syllabus, it really helps you to just put these ground rules, expectations, and boundaries in place. If you'd like an easy template to make your own syllabus for class, with the wording for some of the policies that I described in this video, you can head down to the description box below where you can grab an editable template with the wording already in place. So you can just tweak the words if it doesn't quite fit. Or if you're like, yep, that sounds great. That way you don't have to think about how to phrase things just right for your classes. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Do you have similar policies in place? Are they totally different from mine? Where did you land with all this? Let me hear it down in the comments below.
And if you haven't yet, make sure you give this video a thumbs up, click that subscribe button, and ring that bell so you get notified of all new content I create for you in the future. Okay? I'll see you in the next one. Bye.